it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend Craig Ciro. Uh, he's an ACG member, board member, chair of our programming committee, and president and CEO of Integrated Consulting Services. So Craig, please take it away. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, it's always interesting, these events, learning new things, and I'm look, really looking forward to this presentation. So I'll introduce uh, Bill Studebaker. He's the president and CIO of Robo Global. Uh, Robo Global is an index advisory and research company wholly focused on helping investors capture the unique opportunities of fast growing robotics, artificial intelligence, and healthcare technology companies around the world. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, take it away, Bill. Thank you, Craig. Um, Mary and Nikki for inviting me uh, back. Um, I, for those that um, may remember, I had an opportunity to speak to you all roughly about two years ago. We talked about the, the innovations in robotics and AI and how those applications were going to begin to change the world as, as we live and work. Um, fast forward a couple of years later, we couldn't be more convicted by the changes that we're seeing. And importantly, um, we'd like to talk about the advances and the innovation that we're seeing in healthcare that's being driven by AI. And it's a truly uh, exciting time to, to be an investor, uh, to be a, a patient, a consumer, uh, because we're gonna move into a world of prediction and prevention and individualizing you know, medicine. Um, I'm fortunate to have uh, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Manish uh, Kathari on the call with me. Uh, Manish is a uh, strategic advisor to Robo Global and a shareholder. Uh, and importantly, uh, Manish is the head of ventures at the Stanford Research Institute Ventures Group, uh, where he has a front row seat to what's happening in, in innovation. Um, uh, for those that may not know, and Manish can talk about it, but SRI has, has had some amazing incubations. They created the first satellite TV dish. Um, Siri, the brains behind Intuitive Surgical's uh, Da Vinci, um, the, the internet, just to name a few things, the mouse. Uh, so it's pretty amazing to have Manisha's perspective. He's one of 1,800 uh, PhDs at, at SRI that, um, again, are really on the front lines of seeing where the innovation's occurring. Um, again, what's so exciting about healthcare is that we're really on the front ends of one of the greatest technological shifts ever that's being driven by uh, the performance capabilities of computing, which are essentially doubling every 18 months and our costs of computing are plummeting. This is now creating an array of use cases that a few years ago were only Elon Musk, you know, science fiction and healthcare is certainly right for disruption. Healthcare as we know it um, isn't healthcare, you know, it's sick care. Uh, we're moving to a world of prediction prevention and um, it's essentially what's going to happen is that we're going to be lowering costs improving uh, uh, patient care and essentially extending human longevity so kids that are born now are not going to live until they're 70 or 80 try 100 try 120 plus as we have the ability not just to arrest the signs of aging but to begin to reverse it um, just a little bit about you know who we are and 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 um, and why we created Robo. Uh, Craig touched on it you know briefly for those that don't know Robo Global. Um, again, we are a research and advisory company focused on robotics, AI, and healthcare technologies. Um, feel free to look at our website, which is uh, RoboGlobal.com, to get more details on our, our team and on our focus. But we created the, uh, the firm over eight years ago with the belief that we were uh, entering a period of ubiquitous automation. And at the time, there was no way to, to play this theme, uh, let alone you know, to, to um, actually think that this might be a good idea. At the time, we were one of only seven thematic uh, strategies or exposures in the world. And now we've got close to you know, a couple hundred. But from the early days, uh, we always articulated the importance of, of a, kind of having a longer term lens when looking at disruptive innovation, because the green light, it doesn't always go on or you don't really know when the coast is clear, you know, to go and buy. In fact, you know, innovation falls what's called the J curve effect, where the performance often falls at the beginning 
you know, and then rises gradually to a point higher than the starting point forming the, the letter J. And this phenomenon applies to a variety of areas captured by innovation. It requires management discipline and commitment to stay the course because it reflects a period typically of unfavorable returns that's followed by a period of gradual recovery that rises to a higher point than the starting point. And we're seeing that everywhere from, uh, you've seen it from Tesla to intuitive surgical with uh, their surgical robotics uh, to iRobot with the cost and penetration in, in, uh, in home cleaning uh, to you know, um, sequencing the first human genome. And so um, to, get, to get it right you know, requires, I think, the discipline to understand um, where the world is going and to stay the course. And investing in disruptive technologies is obviously very difficult because everyone wants to define the one that works. But it's difficult to be there because investors typically sell what works, they sell what doesn't work, and they're stuck uh, with what's in between, which typically is not that not glamorous. Uh, so we put together a team of industry uh, experts and financial experts to help investors um, capitalize on this. Um, you know, briefly, our strategy, not to, to tell you too much because that's not the focus here. We want to talk about uh, disruptions in healthcare, but our strategy for those that may care is, is research driven, where we try to identify the companies that are best in class in robotics, AI, in healthcare technologies. Um, we tend to focus on companies that are more smaller and mid cap because we think that's where uh, the innovation is happening, not to mention they tend to be in the catbird seat of where the M&A uh, is following. Um, we were, have been fortunate since we launched our robotics uh, index and ETF uh, eight years ago, we've had upwards of about a third of the index has been acquired. And that just speaks to the innovation um, that, that's, that's occurring. Um, these strategies have very over, low, um, excuse me, low overlap with traditional indices. And so um, we think this is interesting for investors to uh, consider. Uh, the next slide just briefly identifies our three indices that we've uh, created. The first was our uh, robotics and AI index, which we did eight years ago. We essentially created the first classification system. Think of it uh, as the NASDAQ, if you will, uh, for robotics and AI. Uh, we had to create our own proprietary um, um, sectors to identify these companies as either a technology or an application. So you can see you know, on, on, the, on the top, we have uh, the technologies, which are, are um, things like, um, um, you know, autonomous systems and sensing and, and actuation. And down below, we have where the use cases where they're being applied. So in this case, into uh, manufacturing, into healthcare, into uh, food and ag as an example. Uh, we then also launched two other indices, our AI index, which is Think, which cap capitalizes also on the technologies and applications uh, within um, that area. And, and obviously we have our healthcare innovation index that uh, looks to capture the future of, of healthcare. And we'll talk more about this. Um, our team um, is, is nothing, best, nothing better than sensational. Uh, Manish is one of our esteemed uh, PhDs on the team. He's surrounded by a team of, of industry experts, everyone from uh, in the bottom um, left-hand corner, Raf D'Andrea, who co-founded Kiva Systems. That's Amazon Robotics. Um, he and his two partners were working on uh, warehouse algorithms back in, in 2005 and in 2011, sold that to Amazon for 800 million. And that's started what we see as the robotics arms race um, in, in e-commerce. Uh, we have Daniela Roos, who's the head of AI at the um, uh, at MIT. Uh, we have Henrik Christensen, who is kind of the godfather of robotics, who has um, been in, in the industry for the better part of uh, four decades doing research um, in the area. Uh, you can look at um, our website for more details, but um, certainly this is what I think makes us you know, quite differentiated. Uh, moving on, you know, just to the discussion of, of healthcare um, and investing, you know, in innovation, you know, the world of healthcare is, again, as 
I talked about going to world of prediction and prevention and individualizing medicine. And HTAC is designed to capture and invest in the, uh, in the future of healthcare. We have a, uh, a quick um, um, video just to, to discuss this. Global health spending accounts for 10% of the world's GDP. Over the next decade, with life expectancy and chronic disease on the rise, annual expenditure will likely exceed $10 trillion. This price tag comes with an alarming degree of inefficiency, with several hundred billions of dollars per year considered waste. Throughout history, inefficiency has been the birthplace for disruption across every sector. And for healthcare, that time is now. Robo Global presents HTech, an investment strategy comprised of the most disruptive companies in healthcare today. In a race to meet the vast unmet needs in healthcare, new scientific and technological breakthroughs are driving research and development at an unprecedented pace. Thousands of companies are working to address the world's biggest health issues, like curing disease, reducing nurse and physician workload, and improving diagnostic accuracy. All this innovation is creating a multitude of compelling, yet complex and rapidly changing investment opportunities. To help investors navigate this environment, Robo Global created the Healthcare Technology and Innovation Index, HTEC, tracked by ETFs on the New York and London stock exchanges. HTEC provides unique and diversified exposure to the most innovative companies in healthcare. To construct the HTEC portfolio, our team of analysts and industry experts apply a deep research driven methodology to identify the companies that are defining the future in the fields of surgical robotics, 3D printed implants, next generation gene sequencing, and many more. The result is a global diversified portfolio of small, mid, and large cap tech forward companies that investors don't typically own. This is what makes us unique from traditional healthcare indices, which are more heavily weighted by large cap pharmaceutical companies. HTEC's diversification enables investors to capitalize on the faster growing and more nimble innovators. This backtest shows HTEC's historic returns compared with the Global Healthcare Index and World Equity Index. Healthcare's technology revolution is now. Invest in innovation, invest in HTEC. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of reference for our excitement around healthcare and the areas that are ripe for innovation. Um, clearly, this is a technology-driven revolution, healthcare, and it all starts with going on or moving to um, early detection. You know, all solid tumors fall a pretty predictable path from local and treatable to metastatic to lethal. So this is providing the rationale for early detection. And as prices drop below $1,000, nearly you know, all age groups above 40 will be screened for cancer cost effectively, potentially saving up to you know, 1.4 million lives in the US alone. And the convergence uh, between among innovative technologies has pushed the cost of multi-cancer uh, screening down 20 fold from $30,000 in 2015 to 1500 bucks a day and is expected to fall precipitously in the years ahead. So again, the early screening, the world of prediction prevention is, is a direction we're going. Um, Manish will we'll talk a little bit more about this um, in his remarks. Uh, <clears throat> moving on to the next slide, you can see that the healthcare innovation has seen a lot of milestones. Um, the seeds were actually planted years ago. Costs were way too high and they still are high. And much of the early growth was very linear, but we're moving to a world now of exponential growth. Uh, the first DNA was actually sequenced, as you can see in, in 2003, it was sequenced for uh, $2.7 billion, which required 13 years of computing power and now costs $500. And you know we're going to $100 to then $10. And once you understand mutations, you can understand disease 
and then cure it. So that's where we're going. And that's why we really are, are so excited about this. <clears throat> As the next slide you know, points out, um, what's super exciting about healthcare is that it is one of the least digitized areas of all sectors of the economy. There isn't an area of healthcare that is not ripe for, um, for disruption, um, be it the costs are too high, being having um, you know, a bad or misdiagnosis, um, you know, the, the, the list goes on and on. And so the opportunities for healthcare um, is gonna go on for years, if not decades uh, ahead of us. And you can see here that innovation is going to be needed to, to solve the problems that we have, whether it's you know, aging population or whether it's rising costs. Again, healthcare is 20% of our GDP. Um, that's simply unsustainable and it has to change. We have a, a shortage of skilled workers. If you look at you know, places like uh, in the US, I think there are roughly 2.4 doctors per 10,000 people. In China, it's more the order of 1.4 doctors per 10,000 people. As you move into more uh, acute areas, um, it's even more intense. I believe there's roughly 20,000 oncologists in all of China to treat um, a population of 1.2 billion. You know, the only way to solve this is with automation, the AI, a medical error um, or misdiagnosis is actually the third leading cause of death. So again, a lot of areas are very, very ripe for, for disruption. Um, as you can see, the future of healthcare is going to be profoundly changed as we're going to a world that has become much more digitized as the previous slide had outlined, we're at low single digit penetration rates for digitization, that's gonna change. We're going to a world that's gonna become much more decentralized, that's gonna result in, in better patient care uh, and, 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 and lower costs. We're going to a world of prediction and prevention and, and that's the direction you know, we're going. We're super excited about this and I think the opportunities are endless. As the next slide, you know, highlights, um, you know, uh, healthcare has seen a, a, a tremendous amount of innovation. It's in the fast lane, um, and which is why um, is ripe for disruption. And money continues to pour in. As you can see, um, the number of deals and the funding has continued to uh, increase. Um, you, here, you're seeing, you know, companies actively develop everything from. AI solutions for clinical trials to AI for remote monitoring to machine learning for electronic health record processing to cybersecurity for, for data protection. Um, CB Insights, who also uh, put the data together for this, announced their, their fifth uh, annual list of the 100 most promising AI companies in the world. And among them were actually eight healthcare companies with solutions for everything from drug R&D to clinical trials to surgical intelligence, among others. So this continues uh, to be, again, kind of the fast lane in terms of where the innovation is going. And as the next slide you know, points out, um, you know, the opportunities for investors to invest here um, is certainly you know, evident. You can see uh, the returns of our healthcare innovation index have far uh, outpace that of, of global indices. Um, while nothing does go, go straight up, we have seen a little bit of a pause uh, in the performance this year. Um, the index is up about 3% lagging the market uh, ever so slightly after being up roughly around 68% last year. But again, we think we're on the, uh, the front lines of a tremendous amount of disruption ahead of us. So with that being said, um, I'd like to pass over to Mish and he can um, give you some insights on the disruptions and the excitement that, uh, that he's seeing at SRI. Great, thanks a lot, Bill. So maybe I'll just start by a quick introduction to SRI. We've been around for 75 years. Um, as Bill said, you know, things like the computer mouse, uh, the first internet message, uh, ultrasound for medical diagnostics, intuitive surgical, uh, Siri, Nuance, which was recently in the news, was created by us uh, early back 20 years ago or so. So we've been around for a long time. We've done some great things and uh, really excited to be here today. I'm going to, before I go to the next slide, I just want to talk about two personal stories that, that sort of reflect 
what I'll be talking about in the next few slides. The first one's about my mom. So my mom passed away a few years ago with uterine cancer. Um, she, when she first got diagnosed over 10, 15 years, 10 years before that, she had the usual cocktail of therapies, chemotherapies, massive side effects, but very successful. Eight years go by, they stop working. And my dad, in his desperation, tries treatment after treatment after treatment, most of them with horrible side effects and with no uh, outcome uh, that worked. That was 2015, 16, 17. So just a few years ago, three or four years ago. Today, the situation would be very, very different. For exactly the same person, my mom would have a, a biopsy of one of her tumors. We would do a full sequencing of the tumor. We would actually in vitro test whether, um, whether any new drug therapy would work against that tumor and only give that one to her. What a different world from even four years ago. All the pain she had to go through trying 10 different therapies would not occur today. Roche provides that, for example, uh, and there are others too, uh, genomic health and others. So this is just a reflection of the profound changes that have happened in the last five years from sequencing. The second story is on a totally different note, and I'll have a video about this later on too. So a grandfather who also did just pass away recently uh, at the age of 99, he needed a walker. And when I would go to see my grandfather, the first thing he would do, the very first thing he would do was try and chuck his walker behind the couch. You know, he didn't want me to see we, we, him with the walker. He wanted me to see him as he was. And, you know, this is an important story and lesson. You know, it's not just about being healthier. It's about mobility. It's about dignity. It's about many more things than, than health. But the underpinnings of what we're talking about here today are going to be what lead to those changes, both in terms of longevity or agelessness, as, as Bill had described it, as well as quality of life when you are living those lives. Both are equally important and we're in a great time. I'll just, before you, last comment before the next slide, or we can get to the next slide. My background uh, is, you know, I started my career way back when, 30 years ago, building hips, knees, and spines. Then I built bigger things like MRI scanners, PET scanners, and then I fell in love with the software world because I saw how the software world was changing the world. And we did the first telemedicine company that was probably sold came, was one that I founded. And I've been around the healthcare area ever since, uh, focusing a lot on software amongst other things. So let's just say, you know, there's really a few things we want and, and, and let's talk about it. We want increased effectiveness of the drugs and techniques therapies we're using. We want increased convenience. And I think Bill described it beautifully earlier. We want it with fewer side effects. And to get that, we need two things. We need faster innovation because we don't want to wait another 10 years before there's a drug for Alzheimer's. None of us do. And we want true personalization. In the ideal world, we would like a drug to be created that is uniquely applicable to our biochemistry and our lifestyle. So these are the extremes. And what I'd like to say is, they're not that far away. We are talking about true personalization starting in a few years from now. And I don't mean 15, I mean a few years with broad true personalization happening within a decade. And I'm gonna give some examples of how about faster innovation, which enables that. I think let's step back, you know, first there's really complicated, healthcare is not easy. Here's an example of how it's not easy you have very complex biochemistry and bio defense. In the blood, in the brain, for example, you have a thing called the blood-brain barrier. It's a barrier that's designed to allow nutrients to pass through to the brain, but no dangerous things such as viruses, bacteria, which are pretty small, and other elements. This same barrier causes a, a, a tremendous difficulty when you're trying to treat, treat diseases such as Alzheimer's or even metastatic brain cancer tumors. The same barrier doesn't allow drugs to be transmitted through. So the very things that our body has been designed to protect us 
is causing some challenges in how we do it. And I'm gonna talk about how these are being resolved now. If you go to the next slide, another thing that's a challenge. So I'm trying to highlight that there are some challenges. If this were easy, it would be done already. You know, in the, in the world of, of windmills and physical objects, over the last four or five years, and you know, Robo has really captured this trend beautifully with, with its Robo stock thing, uh, stock uh, indicator. We've started making digital twins. We've actually started making very complex digital twins. We can actually even model things like friction and lubrication, which are not easy to model at all through digital twin. Once you've made a digital twin, you can do a lot of things. You can run a lot of simulations on software, reducing your cost. You don't need to make 50 windmills of different sizes to see which works. You run it on software. In the past, the digital twin was not good enough. But with the combination of better sensing and AI, we can do that. In the human body, making digital twins is still hard. We don't have a full sense of what the, what the digital body is, uh, is like. We don't have sensing capabilities to know how much potassium is being used by our muscles as we exercise or our nerves. So these are all elements that make it challenging. If you go to the next slide, there's other challenges too. So I don't mean this to be a damper. I know it's lunch, but I'm gonna start by just talking about the challenges and then move over to the, the solutions here. We all have heard this, right? You know, highly siloed data. It is not just that it's highly siloed, it's really poor quality. I mean, you've heard again and again, physicians are tired of what the electronic health records do. So they fill it full of gibberish and they actually keep the notes that are relevant on a piece of paper on the side of what they do. So you've got a lot of data, but it's siloed, it's poor quality and it's not, it's incomplete. How do you create, take full advantage of the AI revolution when you're in this circumstance? Next slide. So coming back, let's, I just sort of highlighted some of the real challenges that we're facing right now. And I'm gonna talk about some of the changes that are happening that, that will uh, go through this. If you go to the next slide. So first thing, I mean, you've heard the term data is the new oil. It's a partially correct answer. Data, another better way to think of it is data is the new sand. Sand is actually used for a lot of things. Sand requires a lot of processing, but when you process sand, you can make things like glass. You can make things like ceramics. You can make things that form the underpinning of your phone. Data needs to be processed uh, to do it. And I just hear a comment that data is the new bacon. Is that what I see down there? Uh, sure. <laughs> Everybody loves bacon. So that's an easy, easy one. Uh, so the first big change that's happening is there's a lot of synthetic data being created. And let's talk about COVID, for example. You had a situation where every hospital had its own data sets on COVID, the response, what therapies, how it was working. But because of privacy issues, nobody was willing to share that data. This is a real challenge. On one hand, you have maximum privacy, but zero utility. On the other side, you have maximum utility, but zero privacy. That is not an acceptable answer. What, what's happened in the last year is the combination of new AI algorithms allow us to create perfect anonymized synthetic data. This is a very hard problem because what you do when you create synthetic data is you may lose sometimes the small signals that are in there that you're really trying to discern. This is possible to do now. Uh, think about Biobank, uh, which is the UK genomic database and all, all in one, which is the one in the US. Those data sets contain tens of thousands of deep genomic information, but they've never been able to be exchanged with each other. This is possible now. COVID was one of the drivers that transformed the privacy issues and the creation of synthetic data and data aggregation. Next slide. Data virtualization. Now this sounds like a fairly boring subject, but I think we all know, look what happened in the IT world as virtual machines were created. I mean, AWS, Google, uh, Microsoft, um, bunch of others from Akamai and others have built massive uh, systems based on 
virtual machines or machine machine virtualization. VMware's whole existence is on machine virtualization, which is creating instead of each person having one server, one server hosts many virtual machines that are distinct from each other, allowing you to scale efficiently. We've had challenges on the data side. I think you can talk, listen to big companies, even Fortune 100 companies that will say that they've spent the last five years of their AI journey creating data lakes, creating data marts, loading things into systems. This makes no sense. What, what you're doing is you're reducing, not increasing the flexibility of companies to be nimble to changing circumstances. By creating these complex systems with flow throughs and cleaning, that doesn't work. This next generation of startups that are coming out over the last two years have really focused on data, data virtualization or creating virtual machines, but for data. So in other words, you don't have to spend billions of dollars creating data lakes that all these companies will have to do. You instead say, you know, if there's a new sensor, it's spitting out new data, I'm just going to virtualize it and incorporate it the same way I deal with virtual machines. This is a fairly complex technical problem, but I'd like to, to point out that this is actually one of the underpinnings, this and the previous slide, are two of the underpinnings that are actually gonna transform healthcare in the next 12 to 24 months. All the issues you've been hearing about siloed data, um, poor quality data, these are being resolved with these two fundamental technology underpinnings. Next slide. We talked about digital twins. So I talked about the data side of things. What we also have now is exquisite sensing. One, I'm gonna show a, res, uh, a product that's come out into the marketplace just in the last couple of months. The thing here, the story of my grandfather is one where we go, I don't wanna wear an exoskeleton. If I'm not willing to put a walker on, I'm not gonna be willing to put an exoskeleton on, but I'd like to create something that enables me to wear something that is clothing soft wearable, I could wear it under my clothes or over my clothes or just by itself. Uh, that allows me to increase mobility. To do that, I have to create a personalized digital twin first to understand how I walk. Do I have arthritis? Does it change things? All of this can be done very, very easily with off the shelf sensors today. And if you play the next movie, you'll see a product that's coming out. This, it's actually just come out. They'll do it. When I close my eyes, I can see the trail. And I'm done wishing I was back out there. Done thinking those days are behind me. I needed a shift. And that shift was seismic. A fusion of apparel and robotics. With a drive to get up and get out there. And the confidence to stand tall. and the energy to keep going. My feet are back on the path. Carry me onward to what I love. Finding that perfect shot. That feeling, that's seismic. So you get a sense here, right? That this is, this is the change. So this is, while uh, this would not be possible without advanced sensing, advanced uh, without AI, because it is, how do you process all of those signals ultra fast, come up with the response that, that is there? Uh, it wouldn't be possible without wearables like the watch, which allows the person to modulate how they want to feel when they do use this. Do they want more, more stiffness today or less stiffness today? So those are all elements. Do they need help sitting or standing or just standing while they're cooking? These are all possible now and these are going to change the way our future are. Let's talk about another area. So I think we've all heard and we all know that the time for, um, the time for clinical studies is 15 to 20 years from the creation of a, the identification of a possible target you can impact to change something to the creation of lead compounds to the creation of drugs and then the testing of drugs. It's a 15 to 20 year journey. Now, 
this is a something, and the costs have gone up from hundreds of millions to billions and billions of dollars. So it's both very expensive and takes too long. I don't think that's a satisfying solution and that will not enable us to get to that extreme personalization that I discussed. First of all, AI itself is transforming this. Today, AI can, one of the big challenges in, in these processes is finding out medicinal chemistry, trying 15 to 20 drugs, finding which ones have potential issues with heart uh, toxicity, with other types of toxicity. All of this now can be done via AI. You can actually take existing compounds, train them, create a model, decide what you want your outputs to be, and create new chemical entities. So already there are over dozens and dozens of companies and three or four very strong ones that are starting to create more tar uh, lead compounds to go after targets. Now you're running into the next challenge. Okay, we've created these designs. How do you make them? If you go to the next slide and just play the video, this is around a minute and a bit long. Synroute uses AI, big data, and an understanding of how chemists work to analyze and optimize route designs in seconds rather than days. It then prioritizes candidate strategies based on cost, likelihood of success, and ease of implementation. Utilizing an inkjet printing platform and robotics automation to mix reagents at microliter scales, Synjet then tests and validates candidate strategies in seconds rather than hours or days. This high throughput, fully automated screening process supports efficient design of experiment strategies, allowing the chemist to zero in on optimal reaction conditions and settings for scaled up synthesis. Candidate strategies are then brought to AutoSyn, our multi-step miniaturized chemical plant in the lab to produce material at a scale suitable for testing. Computer-selected routes dictate subway maps through modular components that control conditions and chemical reactions in a continuous flow process. Nearly 4,000 unique multi-step routes are possible on the cityscape, with the flexibility to switch between two synthesis runs in less than two hours. Integrated real-time analytical feedback enables the automated capture of digital synthesis protocols that ensure reproducible results across labs. Imagine the production of drugs and medical countermeasures reliably and on demand. From idea to molecule in days versus weeks to months, Symphony accelerates chemistry design, reaction development, and synthesis, and ultimately chemistry innovation. So this is one of, so, as it says, this was funded by DARPA. So what is DARPA trying to do here? DARPA is trying to say, in the ideal world, once I have a target chemical process in the body that I want to influence, can I create leads via AI? So with the human in the loop, but via AI, create potential target compounds, go out and create them, test them, see the delta from what we want versus what it does, input that back into the AI system, closed loop, create new compounds. And in the course of two months, which would normally take two years, find the lead compound to go after. DARPA has invested around $40 million into this at this point research. We already have systems up and running. Um, we recently won another $100 million grant to say, can we make kilograms instead of milli milligrams? And the answer of this is it's beautiful. It's just like a parallel processing of a, on computers. We just create many of them because they're cheap and they just go one after the other and we can create things. Now, when you talk about extreme personalization, this is what you need. If you want to think back about how Novartis or Roche, today Novartis or Roche makes hundreds of liters of their or hundreds of kilograms of their medicine at any given time. This has a couple of real problems. One. If you're making the same thing, hundreds of kilograms, you're gonna sell hundreds of kilograms of that. It's very hard to do extreme personalization. Two, one of the big disadvantages, most of these uh, reactions are exothermic, meaning they release energy. You can't, um, you can't create these things by doing continuous flow. You can make very small quantities that don't release energy exothermic reactions or so much energy. So therefore, you don't need complicated cooling, environmentally degrading uh, systems. 
you can do things much better for the environment as well. These, these new methods are what we're looking at. Eli Lilly has set up a massive center in San Diego that does exactly this. So this is the future of drug innovation on the chemistry side and actually drug manufacturing on the other side, which is a minimum requirement to then sell uh, at, an, at a more personalized, create and sell at a more personalized level. Go to the next slide. And then the last thing, you can just play the video here and then I'll talk about it. The volume will probably need to be up. See, a while to fall asleep. You usually have a few. Pretty exhausted and I don't sleep very well. Um, and it takes me a while to fall asleep. I usually have a few bad dreams and that wakes me up or I'll wake up and I won't feel rested. And it makes me exhausted for work the whole day. Yeah. So the point I'm making here is that when we talk about speech recognition, we think about Siri, we think about, uh, you know, we think about Google, we think about Amazon. We realize that most of the, the portion is thinking about words. They're trying to catch our words. But when we think about how we interact in real life, most of our reaction is actually through the tones. We're reaction, we use our voices as gesturing agents or explaining what we have or not. This is a concept of, think of it as emotional uh, intelligence from voice. There are systems now that can do this extremely well. And in the, in the beginning, pre-AI days, people were trying to do sentiment analysis. So they were trying to classify, are you happy, sad, or otherwise. There's lots of data now that shows that it's actually very hard to classify if something, somebody is happy or sad or otherwise. These are very difficult things to do. Everybody's different. However, using neural nets, you can start classifying certain responses and behavior. On the right, what I have is this concept of GPT-3. Some of you may have heard about this. GPT-3 is really a breakthrough in natural language creation. So GPT-3 is a very large data set that was created by OpenAI, a group founded by Elon Musk and, and a few others, that now enables you to, to create synthetic language that is almost indiscernible from natural language. Why is this again relevant? The biggest challenges in one of the, in healthcare, why is it relevant in healthcare? It's relevant in many areas, is the biggest challenges in healthcare is the mismatch between the patient communication ability and the physician communication ability. The, the patient is inherently lack of knowledge, nervous, worried. The physician, on the other hand, knows too much. They're trying not to say all the possible outcomes, many of which have low probabilities. The ability to use these techniques, GPT-3 and um, uh, detection of tone, actually is changing telemedicine. And in the course of the next two to three years, you are going to see digital front doors to almost all physician capabilities that are very smart. The simplest way to think of the difference is you're going to have a virtual medical resident rather than a virtual scribe or a person a receptionist. A medical resident is able to really help you and then explain what the results are. You go to the next slide. I'm going to end with this slide. This is a paper that came out, I think, last week. And I think it's a really, really important paper. Uh, all of you have heard about CRISPR and Cas9. I'm sure you've had conversations about it. This is the first study that allows uh, people to program epigenetic memories, so as opposed to breaking DNA stance and inserting something new. This can temporarily switch on and off genes that create epigenetic uh, reactions, so reactions to your current environment. It can, these changes can be heritable, so you can actually, they can be passed on from gene to gene, but they can be turned on and off, so you can turn it off again when you need to turn it off. So think about the example where you can turn off the gene that creates tau protein tangles that are considered to be a part of Alzheimer's. You can turn them back on if you want to. So CRISPR on and CRISPR off is a really revolutionary upgrade to CRISPR and what it can do. And this 
combined with some of the other big revolutions happening in CRISPR. CRISPR has been used a lot in uh, lab settings. There's a lot of work going on and some great startups that are talking about how we can actually provide CRISPR in vivo in humans. Uh, that combination of those changes and this publication uh, arguably is going to be one of the most transformative things that happens in the next 10 years uh, in terms of therapy. Uh, happy to take questions. Um, I'll pause here. There's a lot more we can talk about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manish, and thank you, Bill. This was um, definitely exciting and a lot of information to cover in a short time. Uh, Craig, I'm going to just start to you if you have any questions that have come your way. Um, not yet, but I have a couple. Um, As I knew so. you would. <laughs> So um, one question I have is, you, you know, you talked about the speed of innovation. Is there is there a risk that um, basically with the speed of innovation, innovations that you've invested in today are going to become obsolete before they actually can become, you know, uh, fruitful for the investors? Does that, does that make sense? So I'll, I'll start and then if Bill wants to say that, that's a great question. So yes. That is absolutely true, depending on how you choose where the innovations are. So let's give a specific example. Around three years ago, uh, AI platform companies were raised in the startup world. And I remember looking at dozens and dozens. I did not start even one. And I, you know, I start 10 to 20, 15 startups a year. And why didn't we start one? And it was simply because I was looking at Google, Amazon, and the other established players and saying, some of this is going to come out really fast from these established players. It's much better to invest in a chip, which is going to be harder to reproduce, a mythic, for example, or an edge AI, which is going to be much tougher for somebody like Amazon or Google to come up with easy protocols for investment. So those are areas we invest in. So there are some areas where the bigger entities, the bigger large caps, which are leading a lot of innovation are open sourcing elements and taking a financial loss leader approach. But there are so many white spaces that are there. And in healthcare in particular, because IP is such an important portion, as long as you can corner a very strong IP position, there's ways to actually tell if you've got a solid shot of succeeding. Yeah, I guess you know, the only thing that I would, I would add there is that um, areas that are ripe for disruption are gonna bring in um, a lot of other entrants. And this is certainly the case um, if you look at um, surgical robotics back in, uh, in 2000 or 2019-98 um, intuitive surgical, began um, selling the Da Vinci. And they were obviously the first you know, company to market. They're arguably the gold standard uh, in surgical robotics, but they're now more than 40 other companies that are working on various other surgical robotics. And as Manish talked about, what's kind of different, which is a positive and negative, is the advent of what's called ROS, which stands for Robot Operating System. So Essentially, um, it is much easier for um, uh, incumbents, uh, or I'm sorry, entrants to come into market and start out with um, some sort of innovation. Because if you could imagine a, a surgical robotic um, um, activity that maybe was being funded at, at Stanford, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you would you would you know typically start doing your research, and then what would normally happen is that you'd run out of money and the innovation would essentially collapse or would be no scale to it. Uh, and there was no shared learning. And now with Ross, there's shared learning. So uh, people aren't starting out at the ground level, they're starting out much higher. So there is risk of disruption. Um, we kind of spend a lot of time focusing on companies, uh, understanding their technology, understanding their market share, and understanding um, their path and routes to commercialization because there are obviously a lot of great technologies that never make it to, to market because of uh, poor um, management leadership and, and execution. So that's always always a risk that you have to be mindful of. Great, thank you. Um, question from the audience. Um, how would you view the privacy within the evolution? 
Right. So maybe I'll take that one and I'll take that one and and then the, the next one as well, which is under there about the transparency. I think those are so I think privacy is really, really critical. And privacy is something that we are seeing uh, everywhere. And in healthcare, of course, it's hypercritical. Uh, this is why I've, I've been talking about there's two technologies that are really underpinning and reducing the risk on the privacy side. One is this concept of synthetic data that I described, the concept of you can create identical data sets that are not traceable back in any way, shape, and form. And in COVID, these played a very major role in helping come up with decisions quickly. The other is this very unique technology called partial homomorphic encryption. <laughs> and it's a, it's a technical term, but think of it this way. Um, if you can, so I, my, one of my starts at joining SRI was I came there actually from a nonprofit motive where I was seeing a real problem in pediatric care. The trouble in pediatric care is that it's a very rare occurrence, let's say pediatric cancer. So even a group like Stanford or Mayo or Harvard may only have 15 to 20 patients of a particular type in their data sets. This makes it really challenging for a doctor to figure out what to do. So what does a doctor do today? They say, oh, I had a friend who went to medical school who's now in Harvard and I'm in Stanford. So let me call that person and see what the case. It's a highly inefficient way to do these things. Another way is to create a central bank which everybody's data is comes partially encrypted in a homomorphic encryption way. So it's an encryption method where you cannot discern the original data, but you can do computations on the original data. That's one way that people are doing to get around the privacy issues. I think privacy in healthcare will always require some effort, but I think it is being solved faster than you would think. And I'm, I'm the sort of person who doesn't get positive unless I really feel that there's some positivity here, but I actually think the privacy issue in healthcare is going to go through a year or two of problems where there'll be hacks and other things, but the technology to solve it is well underway. The second one, which is a lack of transparency and the ability to explain is a really big deal. There's two, two issues here. One is, are AI, neural net, and deep learning techniques accurate enough for the problems? And then can they explain why they came up with their decision, uh, decision, what they did? It's a great question. Over the last 10 years, DARPA has probably funded half a billion dollars worth of research in explainable AI. And these are somewhat oxymoronic. The whole aim of a neural net is to do things without having to explain things, having it be that. Yet at the same time, you need a degree of explanation. Um, there are already solutions where what you can do, think of it the simple way. If you could take all the clinical guidelines or any rules, if you're a finance company, take the rules of your finance company, uh, in, take the document, ingest it as a set of rules, and then from the rules, create synthetic data that becomes the backbone of your neural net. You can actually go backward and forward. The neural net first will have constraints in it now. Two, you can work backward and compare it to the rules and say, this met those rules or didn't meet those rules. So there's a form of explainability that can be uh, achieved as a result of that. Uh, I, so I think you're going to see explainable AI coming out. It's never going to be perfect. It's never going to do things like rules but it's gonna at least be able to explain the rationale behind why it did it to some extent. Well, thank you, that's, that's a great explanation. I have a, a, maybe maybe to build on his original comments. Um, you talked about living till like 120, 100 or whatever. I wonder what the, the economic effects are gonna to be to that. And I just shudder to think my kids are gonna have me living with them for 40 extra years after, <laughs> I, after I get to 90, so. Any, any comment on like the, the long-term economic effects of the longevity of life? Bill, you want to take this one? Um, yeah, well, I, I think that uh, what we're, we're going through now is, again, because of the world of prediction prevention, uh, we're going to cut down the cost of healthcare, you know, dramatically. There isn't an area of healthcare where you're not going to see, you know, cost reductions. And again, you're seeing it. Uh, across the board. I mean, it takes upwards of, of 29 days 
to, to get in to see a medical professional if you need to, if you can go and solve this with a, a virtual care appointment that may cost, you know, 40 to a hundred dollars, you know, for an appointment, you know, you're, you're solving a, a big constraint, um, which is um, saving a lot of money. Not to mention, you know, as, as advances in 5G occur, we're going to be able to provide um, ubiquitous healthcare coverage, you know, globally in in places that, that haven't had healthcare. So um, the cost, you know, will continue to climb. You can be a doctor on a, a, you know, situated on a desert island in the Caribbean, and to be able to provide, you know, healthcare. So the opportunities, I think, are are, are kind of uh, endless. Manish, any thoughts? Yeah, I think just a couple more comments, which is, you know, reducing. Uh side effects and reducing uh, reducing medical errors actually is going to be a fairly dramatic reduction in the cost as well. So I think you're going to see the cost curve bending. Uh, I think you're also going to see the productivity of people increasing over, over their lifetime because of the improvement in healthcare. So you're going to see somewhat of a reduction in the cost. And I don't think it's going to happen immediately, but it will happen over the next three to five years. And you're going to see a, an increase uh, in the productivity or output as a result of improved health. So those two things. Now, whether you want to hang out with your kids till you're 90, 95, I guess it depends on you and your kids, right? So. Right. No, exactly. All right. Uh, that, that's all I have, Nikki. I think we're almost at the end of time. So thank you. We are. And this was perfect. Manish and Bill, thank you both. Thank you, Craig. Um, this was fascinating. And I know there's some more questions. So uh, for those of you, of you who can stick around, please do so. Manish and Bill will be able to stick around for the next 15 uh, to 20 minutes and answer additional questions um, and or just privately chat and network if, as you choose. Um, but thank you again, Bill. It was lovely having you back. For those of you who are new to ACG, we are the largest networking group in the world for private equity. And we drive growth in the middle market primarily through mergers and acquisitions. So please reach out to me if you're interested in learning more. And let's give a big shout out to our Platinum annual sponsors who support this organization along with all of our sponsors to make these virtual and our live events happen. When you're doing business, please think of the following firms. Ballard Spar, Boulay, Bremer Bank, Fredrickson and Byron, Datasite, Growth Operators, Highland Bank, Lathrop GPM, Lurie, Mid Country Bank, Oasis, a Paychex company, Oxbow Industries, Quasar Capital or, or Corporation, and Allied Executives, and Red Path and Company. When you're thinking of doing business, please check these folks out and reach out if you need more information. Um, and by the way, it's not too late to get in on sponsorship. So if you want to have your firm name shouted out on virtual events or live from the podium, uh, come and raise your profile with ACG Minnesota, the leaders in middle market deal making.